Mexico, episode four. Today I'm joined by Pascal Awa from GDL, GDL Circuits, GDL Sensing. GDL uh, part Circuits. Of All Circuits. Yeah, part of the All Circuits group in Guadalajara and Ernesto Sanchez Proal, uh, former minister for Jalisco and uh, CEO of the EMS company. What's the company called, Ernesto? Uh, Rover Automotive. Okay, perfect. So let's start with a quick introduction to you both and your companies. Ernesto, perhaps if you go first and just give us a little bit about your your background, your recent role in government and your company that you're back at the helm of. Sure, thanks a lot, uh, Phil. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here also sharing this podium with uh, Pascal. It's a great honor to be here. So, well, a little bit about my my. Uh, previous experience, I started working in manufacturing in Mexico for IBM in the, in, in the late 80s. Uh, I worked for IBM uh, a little over eight years. Part of that, I, uh, I did a, a couple of years in IBM's development laboratory. Back then it was in Florida, in Boca Raton. Uh, and I was a liaison between the the development area and the manufacturing area in Mexico. So for the introduction of new products. Mm -hmm. After that, I worked for JVL Circuit for 11 years. And in JVL, I started as a business unit manager. And then uh, I, uh, uh, I became the operations manager for the Guadalajara site. Back then, uh, the site had about uh, uh, maybe uh, 3,000 employees and uh, uh, sales of about uh, uh, 300 uh, million US dollars. Then when I, when I uh, finally quit JVL 11 years later, uh, had sales of close to 2 billion US dollars with uh, considering the, the, the smartphone business with uh, mm -hmm. Blackberry then, uh, R -A -R -A -M, R -A -M. and then uh, we already had uh, three sites in, in Guadalajara. After I quit uh, uh, JV, I started a, a company uh, called Energy for the uh, technology development of electrical grids, uh, smart meters. Uh, they have sold over uh, 100,000 meters in, in Mexico, most of them in Mexico City, connected mm -hmm. to, uh, to the utility via internet protocol. Those are for, uh, for both for managing consumption and for uh, uh, assuring uh, that no one is stealing electricity. It's, it's the company that takes steel and they disconnect them. <laughs> that scenario, I still uh, uh, own uh, stocks in, in them. And then I started another company, a manufacturing company called uh, Cerrobe Automotive seven years ago, uh, focused on the automotive industry, uh, initially with mechanical assemblies, and now with uh, also uh, electronic uh, cars assembly capability. Mm -hmm. Uh, located in uh, in the Guadalajara metro area in uh, the, the municipality of El Salto, we have uh, right now four customers, main uh, tier tier one companies. And uh, uh, about three years ago, I was invited uh, by the governor of the state of Jalisco to to uh, become the minister of economic development for the state. Uh, I told the governor back then that I had a couple of companies to manage, but he was. Okay, with that, this year, uh, initially, we started to see a huge demand increase in the manufacturing business. Uh, I talked to the governor again to see if we could do some kind of, of, of deal, uh, allowing me to go back to my business. Mm. Yeah, he uh, agreed uh, uh, yeah. at the start of this year, but he asked me to wait until after uh, the middle term elections. After that, well, uh, he only asked me to keep uh, supporting him and the state in the relationship with other states, regional states, the Bajio area, as the liaison for uh, economic uh, matters with uh, the, the other states. And that's the role that I'm doing for the government. It's a, a, a much uh, less uh, demanding job than being the minister. Uh, and it allows me to focus back on, on my company. So. Right yeah. now, I'm back to being a manufacturing guy in Mexico. I'm very glad to be here in this uh, in this conversation, uh, Phil. Thank you. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, Ernesto. And it's uh, 
Yeah, I think it's really valuable to have you here with your with your background in in government and in in the industry itself. Um, just being in one side of it uh, only gives you a certain perspective. I think both makes a big difference. Pascal, a Frenchman displaced in um, in Mexico. Tell me tell me a bit about your story. Yeah, displaced like you like you say. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thanks for the invitation, first Phil. As always, real uh, great pleasure to to chat with you and and today with uh, with Ernesto. Uh, so Ernesto, actually, we have uh, something similar because I started my career with IBM as well in uh, 1985 in in Paris. And um, actually, uh, I was in the engineering and I was uh, exchanging uh, documents with uh, some plants in the US like Fishkill and Burlington, if I remember well. So we, we had a, a common pass at that time in the 1890s. And, uh, and then in, uh, in 92, when IBM started to, to, to divest some of their, uh, let's say, uh, uh, core business, like uh, manufacturing, uh, I moved to uh, Bordeaux in the south of France, where actually uh, Solectron, at that time a very big company in the US, uh, a very big EMS, decided to, uh, to, to buy the, the plant from, uh, from uh, IBM Bordeaux. So actually I started as a production manager and uh, I've been through uh, business unit manager, project management, management of project management, and finally I finished like uh, plant manager for uh, Solectron Global Services. And, um, and then I moved to a very nice country in Europe, which is called uh, Hungary. I moved to Budapest for two years, still as a plant manager, one year for Solectron and one year for Flex, because in 2007, it's yeah, when Flex purchased uh, Solectron. And then in 2008, after one year for Flex, uh, I came back to France when uh, I went to uh, Normandy to, uh, to work for a, a Belgian company, Belgium EMS called Epic. And uh, after two years, that uh, company has been purchased by a big group from Philippines, which is called IMI, which is also in El Salto, uh, close to the uh, plant from uh, Ernesto. And then I've been working for IMI for like five years at the corporate level. Uh, a, a new job um, created by uh, our CEO at that time, Gilles Bernard, which, is, which was called uh, Director of uh, Industrial Excellence. Mm -hmm. So basically, I was on office based in France, but I was traveling 80% of my time because we were having uh, two sites in Europe, in Czech Republic and Bulgaria, uh, four in China, three in Philippines, and one in Mexico. So that the reason why I came first to Mexico in 2011 and then in 2013, uh, the, the business was not going so well. We had some, uh, some let's say, uh, issue in terms of quality delivery. And then uh, my CEO asked me to come here in, in Mexico to, to be the new uh, plant manager and to recruit the uh, next one. Mm -hmm. So actually, I was supposed to, to, to be here for six months, and it lasts like 14 months. <laughs> And, uh, and then uh, my last year for uh, IMI was to, uh, to go to China for one year in Jiaxing in the south of Shanghai to, uh, to help the, the site to start a, a very big and new project for China that would be transferred in the end to, um, to uh, Mexico as well for a German customer. And in 2016, I decided to to really uh, spend the rest of my life in Mexico. And at that time, uh, Bruno that I knew from, uh, from Solecon Bordeaux like more than 20 years ago, and Fabrice Menard, my boss, we are looking for a plant manager. And then we, we had a, a brief chat and we found an agreement. And then since 2016, I'm here in Guadalajara. Yeah, and in Guadalajara, you've you've pretty much built from a greenfield location and um, put the whole plant together. Yeah, I mean, actually, we, we, we took a, a building that was occupied by a shanker, so a logistic business with only, let's say, four walls and one roof. And uh, we did more than 3.5 million US dollar investment in order to, 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 to make a, a very nice building, which is now based on what Bruno uh, 
uh, told us during the inauguration in 2019, which is now the new benchmark for all circuits. So that's true that we, we, we did something uh, based on, you know, more than 30 years of lessons learned. And uh, I can imagine that when Ernesto did, uh, did something uh, for his own company, he took the best from Jabil, from Flex, from, you know, all what we have been able to achieve in the past. So yeah. that's what I did. It's not perfect. We found some mistake, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great building where today we have three SMT line and in the future we, we have possibility to have between 10 and 15. Wow. Mm. Okay. So quite a large capacity there. Very impressive. And great background for, from both of you. Some really uh, interesting history, which should give us some good insight into the conversation. We can't really ignore the elephant in the room, which is the pandemic. And, um, you know, everybody's hoping we're at the tail end of the pandemic and we're looking at a recovery. I wanted to talk a bit about what that looks like for Mexico where you guys are with vaccination rates, what you're seeing in terms of business challenges as a result of COVID, but also increased business demand with people looking at a China plus one strategy that perhaps includes more, more of Mexico. Ernesto, what are you, what are you seeing in, in your sector at the moment and what are you hearing from the people you're talking to? Well, uh... I, I can I, I can tell you a uh, feel that uh, what was done in in Jalisco, especially uh, for the industry, is the the government work very close with the industry to try to minimize shutdowns last year. So the the manufacturing industry, uh, especially the advanced manufacturing and electronics manufacturing industry, uh, never shut down completely. Uh, there were always lines running. It, it decreased uh, the, the, the rate of uh, operation, mm -hmm. but th there were lines running. Uh, can give you an example. For example, Flex uh, was at about 60-70% uh, capacity at the peak of the, of the shutdowns period because we, uh, uh, we, we, we tried to, to fit them within the telecommunications, automotive, etc., and uh, working together with them and with the Ministry of Work, uh, we were able to to uh, to keep them open. The same with uh, with Jabil, the same with Foxconn, so and and with most uh, with most companies. Uh, af after that, uh, we saw a huge increase in demand. You mentioned the China Plus One uh, strategy that accelerated a lot. Uh, there are a lot of projects being transferred from China to. Uh, to, to, to Mexico, specifically to Jalisco and Guadalajara. And by the way, that was one of the reasons why I, I uh, decided to, uh, uh, to put short my term in the, in the ministry, because we're getting a lot of, of new uh, projects to, the, to my own company. But I see the same thing happening with Jabil, with Flex, and with, with most of the contract manufacturers. Uh, uh, with the automotive, we have these. Uh, 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 situation of the chips shortage uh, that mm -hmm. is trying to, to hold down demand, but we have another force uh, happening there, which is the the North American, the, the new version of the North American free trade agreement, where, where the automotive manufacturer needs to be increasing the region to 75% of the components of, of a car. So that is also prompting projects to move from overseas to Mexico. <laughs> so all in all, uh, there is a very healthy uh, demand. Uh, the foreign direct investment grew from 2019 to 2020, despite of the pandemic, almost 40%, grew 38%. So that tells you uh, what's going on here. And this year, uh, uh, my expectation is that it will grow again, probably not 38%, uh, but at least 20%. Uh, I think that this year will end with at least uh, at least uh, 2,500 uh, million uh, of foreign direct investment, 2.5 billion mm. US dollars. Uh, so the, the picture there is good. Uh, we are starting to see some, uh, some challenges uh, in uh, employee turnover, for example, because of that, but nothing that cannot be a, that cannot be managed. And uh, 
specifically in the Guadalajara area, there are big investments in logistics, uh, logistics infrastructure. There's a second uh, uh, landing uh, pad in the airport being built. It will be ready by 2024. This will make it the biggest cargo airport in the country. Uh, and, and basically, because Mexico City has huge issues and the other project, uh, I don't know how, how uh, successful will be the other airport in there. So Guadalajara and Jalisco is taking advantage of that. And also there is a very interesting project of a railway connection directly between Guadalajara and Aguascalientes to the north. Uh, I was taking uh, care of that, I was in charge of that. Uh, and uh, it will be passed to the Secretary of Infrastructure in, in Jalisco, but that will also allow big products like cars uh, and big machines, heavy products to be built in Guadalajara and then ship north and on the way back to bring fuel to, to Guadalajara. So these are only a couple of examples, infrastructure projects being built mm. that will be ready in this administration. We will all uh, contribute to, uh, uh, to, to uh, increasing the competitiveness of the region. And for the Bajio region, there are also several projects going on that that uh, that will uh, improve uh, a lot the competitiveness in competitiveness of of the region, uh, mm. both uh, in terms of infrastructure and also uh, investments in education and uh, these uh, synergies that are being reached between the states. For example, in terms of supply chain integration, new platforms for supply chain integration within the states of the Bajio region. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, time to, to, to be in Mexico, especially in this uh, central region of the Bajío, Guanajuato, uh, yeah. Querétaro, Jalisco, Aguascalientes, all these are, are very competitive states that are uh, uh, running very fast. Uh, uh, despite any, uh, any, any issues with uh, some federal policies like uh, uh, energy, et cetera, uh, these are being overcome by the states, and and uh, they are they're uh, running fast. So I I think it's yeah. a very good time to uh, to to uh, invest in manufacturing, manufacturing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and there's a lot to unpack there. And um, Pascal, let's let's tackle those those areas. We've got certainly you know what the what the pandemic has has done and what it looks like coming out. Um, so let's let's touch on that for you. Ernesto obviously touched on the chip shortages. It's kind of the elephant in the room at the moment. We uh, um, we certainly can't ignore that. And the whole logistics side of the industry is really hurting Asia at the moment and um, perhaps advantageous to you, particularly for the North American market. How, how have you seen the recovery? I know you've had some loss in your business, and that's um, you know that's a that's a tragic thing in terms of uh, individuals. But um, how have you seen the the recovery for the business over the last over the last few months? Yeah, it's definitely complicated because I mean myself in thirty five years, it's, it's the first time it happened to me as you know general manager to have one of his employee. Uh, passing away due to that uh, pandemic. And uh, it happened uh, last month to a, a young lady of 32 years old. So it's, uh, it was really a drama for all employees. And, uh, and honestly, more than a year ago, we, we didn't anticipate that it would last that, uh, that long. And, and now it's almost one year and a half more. And, and, and we still don't see the end of the tunnel. Of course, with the vaccination, uh, gaining, uh, let's say, uh, 60 or 70 percent range in, in some months, uh, we can consider that uh, we will be, uh, let's say, outside the, uh, the pandemic. But, you know, in, uh, in Europe, we are listening to uh, uh, lots of, for instance, uh, France, for example, to say, OK, we need a, a, third, a third dose of vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, Israel, I listen to they are uh, putting a fourth one. So we don't really see, you know, the end of the tunnel with new variants uh, everywhere. So we we keep we keep safe our people. Uh, we we still uh, are using, uh, you know, uh, masks uh, in in the factory. Only myself, I am alone in my office, so that's the reason why I don't wear a mask. But we respect the distance. We respect 
maximum number of people in, uh, in the meeting room. Uh, in the cafeteria, we are not in face of front uh, each other, so we are still applying the, uh, the uh, let's say, uh, all principles which have been put in place by the uh, government of, uh, of Jalisco more than a year ago. Okay, and we have been audited by the uh, government many times. We got a, a sticker that we have been able to put on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, lobby, uh, which uh, which uh, allow us to stay uh, open, in consider as a let's say uh, essential activity here in Guadalajara, and without the support of Ralisco and uh, and and, and Pabulemus from Zapopan, uh, it would have been even more difficult because we'd have been obliged to uh, to shut down the uh, the activity, and we were in. Uh, in uh, let's say introduction of new projects, so it would have been a disaster for us, for our customer, to uh, to bring delay uh, at that part of the uh, of the project. So, first, yes, we had the pandemic, and now for almost a year again, we have the issue with the uh, with the component shortage, and um, we discussed uh, rapidly last week, but it's only honestly getting worse. Mm -hmm. um, for for the passive components, I would say. A resistor capacitor is a bit better, even if we are still struggling with uh, some, uh, let's say, um, metallic capacitor or stuff like that. But for the uh, active, whatever the supplier is, whatever it's ADTI, uh, microchip, uh, Nexperia, I mean, it's very, very, very difficult to get parts before 2022. So that means that we are still going to have in front of us three months, four months, very, very difficult in terms of supply. Yeah, it's a big demand, isn't it? And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's this ridiculous situation where demand is increasing because organic demand is increasing. Demand is increasing because your customers are concerned about shortages, so they're ordering further ahead. Uh, and the book to bill ratio is very, very high, but that's partly because shipments are being held down by the component shortage. So it's this perfect storm of challenges that make that make life very very um difficult for you is it in any specific industry pascal that you're seeing most of those problems is it mainly in the automotive or is it in telecoms and all the other sectors as well um, actually we are almost only automotive here in uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in guara but when uh, we discuss every week we, uh, with a sister plan from france and tunisia uh, there have been the same issue on the uh, on the non automotive industry, whatever mm. is medical and uh, and so on. But in the automotive, we were discussing with Bruno this morning. Actually, I understand that the the plan for 2021 was to sell uh, 120 million vehicles, and that basically it will end up with maybe 80. So that means mm. that based with the, the stock, the the car makers already have on their parking. I think the, the, the demand should drop, I mean, uh, drastically in, in the last quarter of 2021, because they are yeah. not going to make stock of vehicles that will be sold only in 2022. So we, we just wait and see. We, today, we, we, we really pay attention to that, because uh, if, we, if we order components based on what we receive from our, our customer, and that at the end of the day, it's uh, just a stock of components sleeping in our, in our warehouse uh, is going to be really uh, complicated in terms of cash. And I think yeah. that's true for every single uh, EMS company. Mm. Yeah, I think we're, um, we're again at that risk of inventory, inventory overhang and we're moving from just in time to just in case and the pendulum swinging mm -hmm. very, very hard in the other direction. The other thing I wanted to touch on with you, Pascal, and um, we'll talk to Ernesto about this as well, but maybe you can go first, is, the, is this um, the, the reshoring. How much business are you seeing? Europe uh, all circuits as a global business anyway, but you're... Are you seeing much business shift to Mexico and maybe shift back into Europe that was uh, originally destined for China um, and, and other parts of Asia? Uh, we are more and more customer uh, coming from Asia, not only China and also uh, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia and, uh, and, and Philippines. So, uh, I mean, the goal is really to be close to the end user. And, and the end user being in, in Mexico, in US, or in Canada, 
it makes sense to reduce the uh, logistics uh, uh, chain uh, in order to have the um, local manufacturing here. But uh, a month ago, we are discussing about the uh, semiconductor and the lack of semiconductor. And I'm learning that now in Mexico and in, in US, they are going to open and to create new, uh, new manufacturing plant in order to be less dependent from Europe and from Asia for the semiconductor itself. So, yeah. so that means that, of course, we are not going to, uh, to purchase locally all electronic components here. But uh, if we, we can have the dye and, uh, and, and the wafer here, uh, I mean, the rest of the transportation and the transformation of the product, what we call the, the back end of the, of the semiconductor, can be easily uh, uh, made here in Mexico as well. Because the more difficult is the front end with the, with the wafer, with the dye. So, yeah. so we hope that in, uh, in the next uh, years, not only, let's say, the, uh, the, the EMS company will be here, but also uh, more and more uh, components uh, manufacturer. Yeah, and I'm, in, I'm inclined to agree with you. I see shorter supply chains as part of, part of the future and proximity to market, which uh, Mexico has with the North American market being so substantial, um, being increasingly important. So that ideal of having the factory of the world in one, in one distant location with low cost labor doesn't make as much sense as perhaps it did in the, uh, in the early part, in the early part of this century. Ernesto, you're seeing, you're seeing a growth in demand in your business. Uh, is that coming from a trend to reshore from Asia? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I will say that uh, probably uh, ninety percent of the new new coats are are reshoring from Asia, and uh, I can also uh, tell you that that the big cotton manufacturers are seeing seeing the same. Uh, they are uh, even uh, planning uh, to to open new sites uh, for that. And besides what we mentioned uh, about the, the pandemic and about these uh, uh, advantages of producing for uh, automotive here because of the new free trade agreement, uh, we need to consider a huge uh, problem that, that there is now in China, which is the logistics and the cost of logistics. The cost of moving a container has increased uh, maybe fivefold uh, in, mm -hmm. in one year. So the cost of producing in China is now much more related with the cost of moving the stock from China to, to North America. And that is a big motivation for, uh, uh, for companies to, to produce in Mexico, especially if they are talking about a big This is another, an, another big uh, uh, factor that is moving that. And also new niches like medical. Uh, because of the pandemic, the, 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 the medical devices and medical industry, including pharma, uh, experienced a big growth. And, and, and these coupled with the other factors are also uh, adding another sector of growth here in, here in Mexico and especially in, in Jalisco. So uh, you have other factors that are moving, uh, that are uh, uh, pushing this, this uh, reshoring. And uh, in, the, in my specific case, uh, more than 90% is, is like that. And I, I understand by conversations with my friends uh, in the other companies that it's a very similar case for them. So this is a golden opportunity for, for Mexico uh, to, to, to take advantage, to work hard, to, uh, to uh, uh, engage these projects here uh, that's why uh, local governments need to work for that. That's why the, the states in the Bajir region are focusing on that. And also in uh, the northeastern uh, states are focusing on that. And I think that, that they're having interesting results. The growth of Nuevo León and Chihuahua can testify for as well as Coahuila. So very interesting uh, mm -hmm. situation that is happening right now. Uh, as I mentioned, despite uh, some, some concerns uh, at, at the national level, at, at the state level, these are being overcome and these projects are being, are being captured. So a very good time for Mexico that we yeah. should uh, take advantage and work hard to, to consolidate that. 
Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And when you look at the logistics, it's interesting on both sides. You know, Pascal, you talked about the lo the logistics on the supply chain side and having more and more stuff local. I think that makes a huge amount of sense and will give you a huge advantage in Mexico. When you look at the um, the delivery side, your ability to deliver pretty much whatever's going on in the world is much stronger than than Asia and. You talked about that five-fold increase in logistic costs, which I, I would concur with. I've, I've heard those numbers mentioned several times. But the other challenge is the huge number of shipping containers that are on boats outside of the port of uh, Los Angeles that just, that just can't get in. And I'm hearing stories of six weeks to get a, across from China and, and another six weeks to get from the boat to... Um, to the back of a truck before it's distributed in the US. So uh, I think that's that's going to be a huge factor. It's a it's a big opportunity in the short term. Pascal, what do you what do you see as the keys to taking advantage of that? What do you what do you need in terms of improved infrastructure? What do you need in terms of support from the government to 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 take advantage of that? In the short term, you need chips, but Beyond that, what, what do you what do you need to to really grow in Mexico? For me, again, I think we we need to be prepared in terms of infrastructure to uh, to welcome, uh, let's say, a big name in terms of component manufacturer, which are today only in uh, in Asia, and uh, it's not only the the COVID, but for instance, uh, we have some supplier in in uh, in Malaysia who have been uh, closed for uh, two weeks, four weeks. Uh, and it was an initiative for the government. It's not because they were having, uh, let's say, uh, issue at, at their own plant. But uh, in in those countries, when uh, when the government is taking a strong action, um, mm. like in China, I mean, there is no more activity for uh, for one month. And uh, when you take uh, a six months uh, lead time uh, for a component, and uh, one month is uh, is already late. Uh, it's a uh, it's 15 20 percent delay and it's uh, it's huge and mm. uh, and on top of the covid we've got the issue with the with the capacity with the 5g with the automotive with the people doing home office and then consuming more laptop and, and and so on and so we we know all that but in the reality uh today uh, i have some example where we we order semiconductor in january for a delivery in march and we are going to receive them only this month in September. So that means for six months, no component from the manufacturer. We had to go to the district, we had to go to the brokers. Of course, the cost is not the same. You were talking about the congestion of the, uh, of the boat. So that means that we need to fly in the components and it's even uh, more expensive. So uh, at, at the end of the day, I think we, we are all in the same uh, boat. All EMS, we did the same. We are running after components, and uh, and and the price at the broker is increasing day after day because there is still a lot of demand, and and for some of us, we are looking for the same component. So it's really it's really hard to believe, but uh, for me, we we need to have uh, like for the uh, let's say a chip manufacturer, some other component manufacturer. Uh, here in Mexico or close to Mexico in uh, in, uh, in other country from uh, Central America or Latin America, but uh, not in Asia anymore. Yeah, yeah, I think that logistic side of it is is absolutely huge. And I've always said about China that they use low cost labor to open the door to the rest of the world, and they use their supply chain and their logistics to keep it open. And that's always, you know, that's been their advantage for a couple of decades beyond. Um, beyond labor rates. Uh, Ernesto, both of you guys are in the um, automotive sector predominantly. How key is the automotive sector to the ongoing growth and success in not just in Jalisco, but in the whole of in the whole of Mexico? And does the switch from e from internal combustion to EV actually present a an opportunity and an, an advantage for you? Those are great questions, uh, Phil. As for the first one, the automotive sector is key to the Mexican economy. The, the manufacturing sector has overcome 
oil and other sectors in terms of the first generator of, of money for Mexico, except for, uh, in some instances, for the money that our, uh, our uh, 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 co-nationals residing in the US send. But uh, that's only occasionally that it, it surpasses that. But the main generator of, of wealth in Mexico is the manufacturing sector and within the manufacturing sector, the automotive sector. So we are now uh, an economy based more on, on manufacturing uh, than, than on than extraction, which is, which is good. We're evolving towards a, 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 a services or a knowledge economy. Uh, having said that, aut automotive is very important, but uh, what you mentioned is key. The, the transition from an uh, internal combustion engine to electric vehicle is one of the biggest opportunities, but also a biggest, one of the biggest threats to, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the, the manufacturing uh, base economy. A big opportunity is because we can build on what we have already done in terms of electronics manufacturing, electrical manufacturing, to produce components for the electric car. You may already know that about 20% of the components of a Tesla are manufactured in Jalisco. Uh, but uh, in the whole Bajir region, the whole supply chain is, is closely tied to internal combustion engines. Uh, for example, you have this uh, uh, exhaust, uh, uh, how do you say that in English, escape the, the, the tubes yep, to the system. Uh, yep. Yeah. In, uh, uh, in Silao, you have a, uh, a, a huge plant also in Silao for, uh, for the engines, for internal combustion engines. So a lot of supply chain linked to that. And as we know, an electric vehicle has only 10% of the parts that an internal combustion engine vehicle. So you have a whole supply chain tied to internal combustion engine that will be affected. Mm. That's why in the state of Jalisco, as soon as I took office three years ago, I started the project to uh, orient, uh, to, to, to direct the, the development of, of the automotive industry to electric vehicles. And, and this became a strategic initiative of the, of the government back then. Talk to, uh, I talked to my friends in the Bajio region, to uh, my colleagues there. Uh, it's, it's not as easy to change when you already have a, a supply base that mm. involves machinery, involves uh, metal fabrication, a lot of things. But anyway, it needs to be moved. Every, everyone has that in mind. I think that ones are moving faster than the others. But as I mentioned, as it represents a huge opportunity, it's also a huge threat. And yeah. we need to be able uh, somehow to employ all the people that will be out of this factory within 10 years, because uh, within uh, five years, it will start to decrease the, 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 the demand. And as you know, the, the United States uh, uh, recently, President Biden stated that uh, there, there should be no uh, IC vehicle produced after uh, 2035. So it's uh, about uh, 14 years that are left to these vehicles. And of course, the, the, the producer, the assemblers will start to actively uh, seek to increase the demand for electric vehicles and decrease the, the demand for, for internal combustion. The, the change mm. it will not happen as a, a, as a ladder function, just, just like this. It will be gradual. So uh, I anticipate that it will start to be felt within five years from now and then gradually uh, be present. So, uh, the industry and, and, and governments should have a, a common strategy to convert to, to the EV to the EV industry. Uh, yeah. and it should be actively pursued by the governments uh, because the, the ones that will carry with all the, un, all the unemployment and, and people uh, in need for government assistance are, are, are the governments, not, not, not so much the industry. The industry will just uh, uh, switch, but the suppliers will will be out of business. So a lot of tier two companies, uh, yeah. the tier ones I know that they have the plans and they are slowly moving there and tier ones are global companies that are being managed with a very uh, uh, good strategy insight and uh, very good execution. But tier two are uh, very often local companies that are just following what the, the, the tier one says and uh, they will start to see a decline in demand and maybe they will not be able to, to support the, the, the move. The new to, demand. To yeah. really, and, and we will not need as many suppliers if you have only 10% of parts. Well, 
maybe it's, it will not only be 10 percent of supplies but but it will be a much uh, reduced a much less uh, numerous quantity yeah. of yeah. supplies. So, huge opportunity but as well uh, also but a huge threat, threat is, is, is like it's a big disruption in the industry like like the uber versus the taxis right huge opportunity yeah. for some huge impact uh, and uh, very bad for others so we yeah. need to be prepared we need to have that in mind and and and, and move uh try to uh, try to be uh, moving ahead with this to have this in mind yeah, and but just before I come to you, Pascal, I wanted to ask Ernesto: Do you do you fear for some of those com smaller Mexican companies that are perhaps more in the mechanical side of the internal combustion engine industry, and and their lack of agility or adaptability to change? Ah, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Ernesto is perfectly right. I mean, we 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 receive some. Uh, um, let's say mechanical, uh, mechanical or plastic parts. For some of them, yeah, it will be still present in the future uh, EV. But for for some other, uh, it's going to be a, a, a big change. And uh, like uh, Ernesto was saying, it's easier for a tier one to adapt a strategy for the long uh, range, like the last uh, next ten years, fifteen years, that for some. Uh, local supplier were just let's say receiving the raw material from mexico from us who are making some transformation and are happy to uh, to uh, to sell that on on, on the local market um, but that's true for some tier two we are not let's say in contact with the electronics for the electronics it will be the reverse because uh, we will have more and more electronics in the ev that in the in the uh, combustion vehicle uh, in terms of safety, in terms of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, uh, car design and, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. People are fan when you see now the uh, the turn indicator we can have on some uh, Audi or whatsoever. I mean, uh, that's something that we consider that uh, as, uh, let's say, like a gadget or luxury, but it's really nice and, and people are are more and more fan of that kind of, uh, of device on their own vehicle. So that means the electronics is everywhere. Mm. And uh, the, the lighting, for instance, is, is growing up uh, faster than, than the rest of the, uh, of the PCBA, at least for, uh, for us. Yeah, so an, increase in the, an increasing amount of demand. And I think a great opportunity for companies like yourself that are adaptable, that have you know, that have got that mix of electro, electronic, electromechanical and mechanical. It's those company, those smaller Mexican companies that are perhaps very mechanically driven, um, you know, that are perhaps only producing mechanical parts for the internal combustion engine that have got to make such a substantial switch. They're the ones that are going to have the big challenge. I wanted to, before we wrap up, I want to talk about one other um switch or trend that we're seeing in Mexico at the moment, and that's investment from overseas manufacturers, particularly large um, manufacturers from Asia building, building or acquiring facilities in Mexico. Um, Pascal, perhaps we can touch on that with you first, and then we'll come to Ernesto. What are you, what are you seeing there from your, for, are you seeing your competition change in, in Mexico? Not, not really. I mean, uh, until now, um, I think it's it's quite stable. I mean, uh, we 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 know ourselves. I mean, uh, um, by heart, and we're the same for the last uh, five, ten years. Mm, some small are disappearing, but I mean, the big name are still are still here. And uh, and and for instance, we we have been approached by uh, some Chinese company like you away uh, a year ago. To, uh, to try to, uh, to, to, to start something here in, 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 in Radisco. But it's very complicated to, to close a deal with, uh, with those uh, Chinese uh, gentlemen or shareholders whatsoever. Mm. Um, it's not the same mentality. You know, they want everything uh, immediately. And, uh, and, and to, to, to set up a facility, uh, we need time. Uh, 
myself, it took us more than a year and a half in order to, to pass through all the administrative steps, in order to have the RFC number, in order to, uh, to, to have uh, uh, all uh, registration with the EMAX, VAT, IMS, and so on. It's not something you can do in two months or in three months. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we've got some support from, from the government. Without that, it would have been even longer. But when the Chinese guy are coming in, uh, they want after six months they want to run a facility, and it's not like that in Mexico, and uh, yeah. and I believe it's not like that in Europe as well. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure that today we 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 fear the Chinese competition in terms of EMS uh, here in Mexico. At least yeah. from my side, I don't know about Ernesto. But... Ernesto, what are you, what are you seeing? And are you see, you know, we know that the uh, most of the top ten. EMS companies are, uh, are Asian owned. Are you seeing more of them looking to develop their footprint in Mexico? Uh, yes, you, know, you are you uh, uh, specifically uh, talking about uh, uh, more facilities and more more uh, more space to manufacture? Yes. Yeah. Well, let me tell you uh, the information that I have from the Industrial Park Association, which is very. Uh, very close to, to the needs of, of what's going on. They they basically are are uh, are, are uh, uh, getting uh, so many requests for land for, from foreign companies that they need to 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 build more parks. They're running out of of, of land. Uh, specifically in in Jalisco, there is a lot of demand for bigger uh, lots of bigger size. Uh, a Chinese company wanted a, a single lot uh, of about 70 hectares, which is a huge one. Uh, some, mm -hmm. some industrial parks are, are, are even smaller than that. So we are seeing a, a, a increased demand for, for land, for new facilities, not only uh, electronics. Uh, I'm talking about all the industry, uh, including food transformation industry. Uh, including pharma industry, uh, mm -hmm. including such things as as uh, uh, components for the food industry like bottles. So yeah. a lot of 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 uh, uh, demand for uh, industrial land is happening right now, and uh, I believe that that's a, a, a symptom of what we just talk about the the relocation supply chains globally. Uh, the big motivation due to the extremely high logistics cost out of China, uh, the new trend in, in something like medical devices, the new free trade agreement. There is a lot of things going on right mm -hmm. now. It's, it's like, like the perfect storm positively for Mexico. And we need to, to, to take advantage of that by working hard, uh, fulfilling our commitments, train our people. So this is a golden opportunity that that will not last forever i mean we, we need to uh to, to to embrace it before the window closes so uh short response is yes a lot of demand for for new land uh and a lot of expansions that are being uh planned or executed by, by several companies not only in the electronics uh, and automotive but also in other sectors yeah, I think it's really exciting and the idea of a, um, a golden a golden opportunity and a golden age of manufacturing in 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 Mexico is uh, is one that's really exciting. And I think that's a great note for us to wrap up on today. I really appreciate both of you taking the time to chat to me today and the insight you've provided. Uh, you know, I absolutely agree with you. You have a great advantage in terms of your proximity to market. You have a growing domestic market. You have improving logistics. If everything on the supply chain side can get fixed, then you are in a, you know, you are in a fabulous position. Thanks so much for your time and great to chat to you. And we'll, um, we'll be in touch again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.